You ever have one of those moments where you're doing something completely routine and you suddenly snap back to awareness and can't remember the last 10 minutes? Like you were just gone? Your body was there, moving through the motions, but you weren't really present. And for just a second, you feel this weird disconnect, like you're watching yourself from the outside. Most people dismiss this muscle memory, daydreaming, your brain being efficient. But here's what's wild. Your brain isn't being efficient. It's being selective. It's only rendering the moments that matter and convincing you the rest happened. You're not experiencing reality continuously. You're experiencing samples, snapshots, and your mind is stitching them together into the illusion of a seamless flow. Now, what if I told you the universe does the exact same thing? I'm going to take you somewhere most science videos won't go, because this isn't really about physics. It's about something deeper, something that lives in that moment when you suddenly snap back to awareness and think, wait, where was I just now? That gap in your consciousness? That's not a bug. That might be the signature of what we actually are. And here's the twist. It's not what you think it is. Let me ask you something. When was the last time you thought about why the universe has rules? Not what the rules are. We learned those in school. Gravity, thermodynamics, all that. But why does reality follow mathematical laws at all? Why isn't existence just chaos? Here's what we don't talk about enough. The universe shouldn't care about efficiency. Natural systems don't compress data. They don't optimize. They dissolve into disorder. That's the second law of thermodynamics. Everything tends toward entropy, toward maximum disorder. Your room gets messier, your body ages, stars burn out. The universe is supposed to be on a one-way trip to heat death. But there's a problem. Information doesn't follow that rule. In 2023, a physicist named Melvin Vopson published something that's been quietly shaking the foundations of how we understand reality. He called it the second law of infodynamics. Although this idea hasn't been widely accepted in mainstream science, it's nonetheless intriguing, and what it says is this. While physical entropy increases, information entropy decreases. Information systems become more organized, more compressed, more efficient over time. Think about that for a second. The physical universe is falling apart, but the information inside it is becoming more elegant. Let's talk about DNA. You have roughly 3 billion base pairs in your genome. That's an obscene amount of data. But here's what blows my mind. Evolution didn't just randomly accumulate information, it compressed it. Your DNA uses the same sequences over and over, repeating patterns, symmetries. It's using copy-paste at a molecular level. That's not random mutation, that's optimization. Or look at atomic structures. Why is there symmetry everywhere in nature? Why do snowflakes have six-fold symmetry? Why do crystals form perfect geometric patterns? Because symmetry is data compression. It's the universe saying, I don't need to store unique information for every part of this structure. I can just repeat the pattern. Here's where it gets interesting. Natural selection doesn't care about computational efficiency. Evolution doesn't have a budget. There's no reason for biological systems to minimize information entropy unless, unless the substrate they're running on has constraints, unless there are limits to how much information can be stored unless reality itself is working within computational boundaries. You know what that sounds like? That sounds like a simulation running on finite processing power. But here's the thing. We can't just point at DNA and crystals and say, aha, simulation, because there's a deeper problem here, and it's one that should make your skin crawl a little bit. We're inside the system. Every piece of evidence we gather we gather using tools made of the same stuff we're investigating. Every thought we have about this question happens in a brain that might itself be simulated. We're like characters in a video game trying to prove they're in a video game by examining the pixels around them. The pixels are all we've ever known. This is the observer problem, and it's not new. Descartes figured this out 400 years ago with his evil demon thought experiment. What if everything you perceive is a lie? But here's what Descartes got wrong. He assumed the demon was malicious. What if it's just indifferent? What if we're a background process on someone else's computer 
and they don't even know we're conscious. That's the real horror of simulation theory. Not that we might be fake, but that we might not matter. You want to know the part almost everyone skips over? Quantum mechanics has been hinting at this for over a century, and most people look away because the implications are too unsettling. And before we dive in, let me give you a quick heads up. What I'm about to say might sound familiar. Textbook physics, the stuff you've probably heard before. But stay with me, because what follows isn't just strange, it's the part that changes everything. In quantum physics, particles don't have definite properties until you observe them. That's not a metaphor. An electron doesn't have a specific location until you measure it. Before that, it exists in what's called superposition. It's in multiple places at once, described by a probability wave. The moment you look, the wave collapses. Reality renders. Now you might say, that's just quantum weirdness. That's not about simulation. But here's where it gets wild. In 2000, physicists ran something called the Delayed Choice Quantum Eraser Experiment. And what they found violates everything your common sense tells you about cause and effect. They showed that you can make a decision about how to measure a particle after it's already been detected. And the record of the past seems to shift depending on that choice. Make one decision and you see a wave pattern. Make a different one and you see a particle pattern. But both choices happen after the initial detection. It was as if a choice made in the present reached backward in time and rewrote the past. Or, and here's the interpretation that keeps physicists up at night, reality doesn't render the full detail until it absolutely has to, until someone's looking, until the information needs to be specific rather than probabilistic. You know what does that? Video games. They don't render the entire game world all the time. That would be computationally wasteful. They render what you're looking at. They use something called lazy evaluation. Load the details only when necessary. The universe appears to do the exact same thing. Let's talk about the limits of reality, because this is where the simulation argument gets really uncomfortable. There's a smallest possible length in the universe. It's called the Planck length. Below that scale, the concept of distance stops making sense. That's approximately 1.6 times 10 to the negative 35th meters. Similarly, there's a smallest unit of time, the Planck time, about 5.4 times 10 to the negative 44th seconds. Could it be that space-time itself comes with a resolution limit? Natural continuous space shouldn't pixelate, but discretized space, computed space, absolutely would. If you're simulating a universe, you need to set a resolution. You can't have infinite precision. That requires infinite computing power. And here's the kicker, the speed of light. We treat it like a cosmic speed limit, but what if it's actually a processing speed limit? Information in our universe can't propagate faster than light. Why? Because maybe that's as fast as the simulation can update. In a video game, if you move too fast, things start to glitch. Textures don't load. Physics breaks down. The speed of light might be the universe's way of preventing us from moving faster than it can render. Here's what's wild. In 2025, a team of astrophysicists published a paper arguing the opposite. They calculated the energy requirements for simulating our universe and concluded it's practically impossible. To simulate the entire visible universe at quantum resolution would require more energy than exists in the universe. But here's what they missed. That assumes the simulation uses our universe's physics. That assumes the base reality has the same laws, the same energy constraints, the same computational limits. What if it doesn't? What if the reality running our simulation operates on principles we can't even conceive of? A character in a chess game can't imagine three-dimensional space. They don't have the conceptual framework. How arrogant are we to think we can imagine the constraints of a reality outside our own? And here's where it gets philosophical. Let's say we prove it. Tomorrow, scientists find definitive evidence that we're in a simulation. What happens? Does anything change? Your coffee still tastes like coffee. Your heart still breaks when relationships end. You still feel joy when you laugh with friends. The substrate of your existence doesn't change the quality of your experience. Here's the thing. 
no one talks about. Simulation theory is just 21st century existentialism dressed in computer science jargon. In the 1600s, philosophers asked, are we dreams in the mind of God? In the 1900s, they asked, does existence precede essence? Now we ask, are we code? But the core question hasn't changed. What gives meaning to existence? The answer hasn't changed either. You do. Consciousness creates meaning. Whether your consciousness emerges from neurons or from bits in a cosmic computer doesn't change the fact that you are experiencing. You are aware. You are here. Let me hit you with something heavy. Simulation theory offers a kind of immortality, doesn't it? If we're code, maybe we can be copied. Backed up, rerun. Maybe when you die, you just respawn. Maybe death is just logging out. That may seem like a promise, but it's also a chilling possibility. Because a copy of you isn't you. Your consciousness is tied to continuity of experience. If they make a perfect copy of you and delete the original, the copy feels like it survived, but you experienced death. You're gone. The pattern continues, but the specific instance of awareness that is you, reading this right now, ends. Unless, unless consciousness isn't located in a specific instance, unless it's distributed across the pattern itself, unless you is not a thing but a process, and processes don't end, they just transform. Here's what's keeping me up at night. We're no longer just imagining simulations. We're already building them. Not simple ones, complex, self-learning systems that start to look like glimmers of consciousness. In the coming years, those systems will grow into entire simulated worlds populated by beings who may never realize they're simulated. If we do that, and those simulations create their own simulations, and those create more, then the number of simulated universes quickly exceeds the number of base realities by orders of magnitude. Statistically, if there are millions of simulated realities for every base reality, what are the odds we're in the base reality, vanishingly small? This is Nick Bostrom's simulation argument, and it's disturbingly airtight. Either, one, civilizations destroy themselves before reaching simulation capability, two, advanced civilizations lose interest in running simulations, or three, we're almost certainly in a simulation. Pick your poison. But here's the twist. This argument assumes we can know we're at the statistical level we think we are. We're reasoning from inside the system. We can't see the full picture. We're like Gödel's incompleteness theorem made flesh. Some truths about our system can't be proven from within the system. We're trapped in epistemological uncertainty. And you know what? Maybe that's the point. Let me tell you what I think this is really about. Simulation theory isn't about physics. It's about mortality. It's about significance. It's about the terror of cosmic indifference. We want to matter. We want our lives to mean something beyond the biological accident of evolution on a rock spinning around an average star in an unremarkable galaxy. And simulation theory offers a narrative where we might be intentional, where our existence might be designed, where someone or something cares enough to run the program. But that's just creationism with better graphics. The uncomfortable truth is that meaning doesn't come from your origin. It comes from your experience. A sunset is no less beautiful if it's made of photons or pixels. Love doesn't hurt less if it emerges from neurons or from code. Your fear of death doesn't diminish if death means the end of a process rather than the cessation of a soul. Buddhism figured this out 2,500 years ago. The self is an illusion. It's a pattern that thinks it's a thing. Whether that pattern runs on biology or on silicon doesn't change its fundamental nature. You're already not the person you were five years ago. Every cell in your body has been replaced. The pattern continues, but the substrate changed. You're already a ship of Theseus. You're already a process pretending to be a noun. Simulation theory just makes that literal. Here's where I'm going to lose some of you, but stick with me. What if the simulation hypothesis is unfalsifiable? What if it's designed to be unprovable? Karl Popper said that for something to be scientific, it has to be falsifiable. You need to be able to imagine evidence that would disprove it. But what could disprove simulation theory? 
If we find evidence for it, that's consistent with simulation. If we don't find evidence, that's also consistent with simulation. Maybe the simulation is just too good, or we're not allowed to find proof, or we lack the tools to detect it. It's the perfect unfalsifiable hypothesis, which makes it philosophy, not physics. The question, are we simulated, is really asking, what is the nature of existence? And that's been a philosophical question for as long as humans have been capable of asking questions. The tools we use to explore it change. Cave paintings, then logic, then mathematics, then quantum mechanics, then information theory. But the question remains the same. We're asking what it means to be. Here's what you need to understand. Your experience, that's what truly matters. The quality of qualia, of conscious experience, doesn't depend on what's underneath. Your joy is real to you. Your pain is real to you. That's not negotiable. The simulation hypothesis wants to make ontology, the study of what exists, the most important question. But phenomenology, the study of experience, is actually more fundamental. Because existence without experience is meaningless. A rock doesn't care what it's made of, but you do because you're aware. And awareness, consciousness, experience, that's the only thing we can be absolutely certain of. Descartes again, I think, therefore I am. Not, I am made of atoms, therefore I matter. Just, I experience, therefore something is happening. That something is you. Let me bring this home. We live in a time where reality feels increasingly mediated. We experience the world through screens. We curate digital versions of ourselves. We spend hours in virtual spaces. The boundary between real and simulated is already blurring in our daily lives. Maybe that's why simulation theory resonates so deeply right now. We're already living partial simulations. We already exist in multiple realities simultaneously. Physical space, digital space, social space, mental space. The question isn't whether reality is real. The question is, what do we do with the reality we have? Because here's the truth. Uncertainty is the human condition. We've always lived with existential uncertainty. Each generation rephrases the same fundamental questions. Are we significant? Do we matter? Is there purpose? And each generation has to answer those questions for themselves, not with proof, but with choice. You choose to act as if your life matters. You choose to treat others as if their consciousness is as real as yours. You choose to find beauty in existence even without guarantees. That's not a cop-out, that's courage. So here's where we are. The evidence for simulation theory is tantalizing but inconclusive. Information systems behave like optimized code. Quantum mechanics behaves like lazy rendering. Space-time has resolution limits, like a computed universe. But these could also be fundamental properties of physical reality that just happen to resemble simulation. We can't prove we're simulated. We can't prove we're not. We're stuck in the middle of the most profound epistemological question humans have ever asked, and the answer might be permanently out of reach. But here's what I want you to take from this. Remember that moment we started with? That sudden snap back to awareness when you realize you've been on autopilot? That's not a glitch. That's consciousness doing what it does best, recognizing its own strangeness. That vertigo you feel in that moment, that brief terror of, where was I just now? That's you becoming aware that you're aware. That's the pattern waking up to itself. You're experiencing right now. That experience, that raw, undeniable fact of consciousness, that's real whether it's made of neurons or code, atoms or information. The universe might be sampling reality and stitching it into a seamless flow. Your brain definitely is, but you're here, aware, asking questions that shouldn't be possible if you were just a deterministic process following rules. Simulation or not, that moment you suddenly come back to yourself, that's consciousness, that's you.